Um, I'm a cultural historian, uh, not a designer or architect, but in the work that I do uh, that brings together curatorial practice that's very much centered on questions of how to bring historical materials alive uh, in spaces, as you'll see, that are not only analog, but spaces of intense light deprivation. Uh, I've really never had the opportunity to think about the question of lighting as a central feature of the work that I do uh, outside of the framework of a broad set of kind of argumentative, storytelling, presentational, even scenographic kinds of considerations. So I'm very thankful to Derek and to Parsons for offering me this opportunity. Uh, in the time machine that's taken us from the future to the present or the recent past, um, I'm going to go further back into the 1970s and the 1920s. And I'm going to talk briefly about two projects that have been ongoing projects, one uh, fully complete, the other still somewhat in process that uh, I've been centrally involved in as a kind of concept designer of curator in chief, uh, a, 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 and as a designer in the broad sense of the word. Uh, and these are both projects in uh, the Trentino region, the Dolomites region of Italy. The first is called Le Gallerie, which in Italian the word gallery or galleria means both tunnel and gallery, and you will see why that's a pertinent consideration in a moment. Um, this is a project that took place, started in uh, 2007, and uh, you can visit it today. Uh, I'm not sure what the programming is at this moment, but uh, I'm going to talk about the first iteration of it and a couple of subsequent iterations very briefly. And the second one I'm going to talk about is uh, the repurposing of a, uh, a, a rather contested historical monument in the city of Bolzano. BZ stands for Bolzano. That's what you would find on a license plate. Uh, BZ 1445, which is a documentation center dedicated to uh, creating a kind of a realm of experience of the years that lead from the um, uh, from beginning of World War I to uh, the end of World War II in the Alto Adige region, which is one of the uh, bilingual regions, uh, as is the Trentino, uh, in uh, this section of uh, northern uh, Italy. Uh, and there would be a great deal that I could say about these projects. They're really complex projects that involve repurposing existing sites, either remains of the industrial era that are abandoned or contested monuments or ruins. I, I can't obviously talk about all of these various aspects of these very complex projects which involve a very high degree of community input uh, that uh, sometimes staggers the imagination, uh, as well as teams with a very wide range of different kinds of uh, talents. So what I'm going to focus in on, uh, just for purposes of this conversation, really are the ways in which lighting plays a key role in the sort of design of these experiences, and their experiences that have to do precisely with this issue, which I, I experience in a different realm in my work as the director of Meta Lab, which is a media and technology lab at uh, Harvard, where we do everything from build platforms to kind of leverage the power of database assets for cultural institutions in new and, um, and imaginative ways, to uh, designing interfaces for libraries, to thinking about the design of uh, other kinds of learning and knowledge spaces. But at the core of all of those challenges, as well as the ones I'm talking about this evening, uh, is this issue of animating archives, of how we can kind of, we can bring materials that otherwise, you know, will comfortably sit, if you like, in a glass case, but won't tell a story, will not seduce, will not persuade, will not create an experience. Uh, and it's those kinds of challenges that interest me here. And in both cases, we're talking about history museums. History museums have not renewed themselves in the multitude of ways that other kinds of cultural institutions have. They tend to rely upon the magic of the original document still uh, to somehow engage audiences. And that has become an increasingly failing proposition. And so these are both examples of experiments with how to bring historical materials alive and for me, the question, questions about lighting um, take on a particular coloration because these are both underground spaces. <laughs> these are spaces of intense light deprivation where the movement from the outside to the inside and then back outside is very much charged with meaning. Uh, and it's, in a sense, the challenge of mobilizing that, those meanings, uh, giving, in a sense, motivating that movement from natural light 
into crypt-like or subterranean environments, articulating a kind of itinerary trajectory around that space and then back outwards that is the key uh, set of design challenges that, that I'm interested in in, in, in in sort of wringing expressivity out of. And there's two particular strategies that you'll see at work, particularly in the uh, Trento tunnels, but also in the Bolzano project, that have to do with exploiting immersive effects, but also playing off distancing effects at the same time and using lighting, in a sense, to explore those two palettes. And I'm going to be talking about really analog kinds of lighting, like found industrial lighting that simply gets reutilized uh, for scenographic kinds of and argumentative effects. And in particular, the role of creating interesting, productive, expressive dialogues between projection-based illumination uh, between static illumination and between sound environments is something that has been a key to these projects. And then last night, but not least, I want to mention something that I hope will be visible, even though these are just static slides, that um, in each of these projects, there's an attempt to create a dialogue between the use of lighting techniques to create phantasmagoric kinds of effects, to bring bring documents, things, objects, voices from the past alive in ways that if they're effective, they are a little bit haunting. In other words, they have a way of coming back uh, to us as if they are ghostly or like revenants, if you like, versus the use of illumination as a didactic tool, as a kind of precondition for an analytical gaze. I'm really interested in staging that dialogue productively. And much of this involves in both cases, letting sites and the kind of crude materiality of those sites uh, speak in their own language, not trying to transform them into something that they aren't. And you'll see why this is an issue, because in the case of the Trento tunnels, we're talking not about galleries, but, but about two superhighway tunnels that are at the entry to the city of Trento. They were built in the kind of grand flurry of urban renewal in the 1970s, destroying, eviscerating the core working class neighborhood of the city of Trento lived as a kind of living wound during that entire period. And then finally, in um, the year 2006, these two tunnels were abandoned, substituted by other entry tunnels to the city of Trento. But this is what we started with when we won the public competition to reimagine these tunnels. And the proposal we made was to create an experimental history museum in these two tunnels. As you can see, the light at the end of the tunnel is not just a kind of metaphor here, but because of the curvature of the tunnels, literally when you enter this space of complete light deprivation or of increasing light deprivation as you move towards the center, you can't see the exit. It is, uh, these were, are spaces that when you experience them as a pedestrian, do have a kind of uh, almost, uh, they create an almost automatically phobic reaction. And one of the key challenges we had was precisely how to make this a, a, a meaningful experience. Um, and uh, as you can also see, they're enormous. They are together, there's two of them, they twist through a cliff, uh, they form an area of uh, 70,000 plus uh, square feet. Um, and uh, those, uh, this kind of area, of course, even with a, the most generous of budgets in the world could not be programmed in a normal way. You just can't design it or work with it that way. Um, it's the site under which these tunnels run is also a kind of identity marker because it contains on the top of the, the cliff one of the signature monuments of the fascist era, uh, this monument to Cesare Battisti, the martyr of the Italian cause in the Trentino in a region that's linguistically divided, a region in which half of the population was fighting on the Austrian side of World War I. Um, there's also a number of other sites that mark it, mark it as a space where identity issues are centrally at issue. And the first exhibition that we developed, the launch event for the tunnels as, an, uh, as a space, was an exhibition on World War I, which was indeed the war that in a sense marks the, all of the complexities and challenges that a region like the Trentino Alto Adige faced and continues to face given its linguistically divided population, given the shifting borderline to the north at the Brenner Pass, uh, given a whole series of other considerations. Uh, and the strategy that I developed as, at the, as the lead of a team of, uh, of scholars, uh, heads of museums, uh, uh, designers, uh, architects, 
was this idea of taking the tunnels and motivating them in two completely different ways. This is where I come back to my um, opening remarks. The, the, the idea was to, in a sense, make one of the tunnels a true literal throwback to 19th century phantasmagorias, to paint it black, to use it as an immersive space, and to tell the story of the war years in the black tunnel, the phantasmagoric tunnel. And you can see we used highway signage as the main sort of navigational tool. So we tried to really respect the fact that this, these are tunnels and they remain highway tunnels. We didn't try to fix them up and improve upon them on the contrary. And then in the second uh, tunnel, to paint it white and to make it instead, as you can see, you march through the black tunnel motivated to see the light at the end of the tunnel, which is the end of World War I. And the tunnel was divided up into sections, zones that had, as you'll see, projections as well as a kind of sound environment where you heard voices reading from letters, uh, uh, documenting the experience of everyday ordinary citizens of the war years. No generals, no big battles, just the way that the war years were lived by or ordinary people from the bottom up, so to speak, grouped into sectors year by year. You exit back out into the light, turn the corner and you enter the white tunnel, which instead recounts the story of the construction of institutions of memory that gradually institutionalize, you might say, different ways of thinking about the experience of World War I. So you can see, I'm just gonna walk you quickly through the black gallery, this, the phantasmagoric gallery, where you can see that there, uh, again, keep in mind the scale. What we basically did was to use projection as the main illumination system. Very crude, off the shelf, El Cheapo, you know, video projectors, which were essentially running, massaged, transformed, mediated versions of archival documents, uh, projected using pretty crude techniques and projected on all surfaces so that you had this kind of disorienting sense of being inside a time capsule broken up into these units, literally marching through time year by year through an environment that told a whole mosaic kind of approach to storytelling, if you like, but they took you through the war years that used the fact that World War I was the first fully documented uh, war in black and white cinematic, sort of documentary footage, but also photography and other kinds of media, um, and transformed that into an experience that uh, made you participate, in a sense, of the, uh, in the unfurling of those years. And I think you can see how crude the techniques were. They were by necessity, by reasons of budget and so forth. The years are marked by uh, essentially posters glued to the wall of the, of the, um, of, of the tunnel, uh, projections that were left to be distorted, letters, other kinds of documentation, actual insets in the places where the tunnel had irregularities uh, uh, for the projection of period uh, documentation of the, uh, uh, the Alpine campaigns and a series of theatrical scrims that were used as projection surfaces so that as you walk down, you could never predict where a projection would happen. You'd have a sense that there were people, ghostly people walking among you. And these are basically images of military figures from both sides of the uh, combat. Uh, so that gives you a sense of the dark tunnel. Then the white tunnel instead, you had this highly illuminated, you, just using the commercial lighting that was already installed within the um, the, uh, the tunnel as part of its uh, infrastructure, uh, a, uh, an itinerary that would take you year by year through the major institutions founded to keep the historical memory of World War I alive, uh, each with its own micro environment that was curated by, one of the, by that institution in question, by the, the institution that, whose foundation was, uh, was marked. Um, this is, these, are, these are the Alpine, this is the Alpine National Museum, which is up on top of the cliff. Um, and I'm just gonna give you a taste of two later editions. This was an attempt to create a kind of permanent exhibition in this space in the form of an, uh, a kind of abbas abbasidarium, a, a kind of ABC book with specific topics with a letter, uh, each with a letter with a kind of montage glued to the wall uh, a panel that had a kind of LED, uh, shifting LED chromatics running through it, a chronology, a short text, a, floor, a ground projection of a macro story and a micro story 
with a little tiny set of screens that you have to stand up right in front of that would be the kind of intimate scale of that theme. This would be the grand sort of public scale. Um, and there's other aspects of this I could talk about, but I think, yes, you can see that lighting is a, obviously a key feature of the way in which this otherwise very plain but very powerful environment is created, it, it, it crafted into a kind of space of experience and narrative. Um, the last of the three I'm going to show you was an attempt to tell the history of Nordic skiing and ski jumping inside the tunnels, which I thought was a really fantastic opportunity. And we took the security corridor and turned it into a pink, a kind of red. This was through uh, essentially gels using standard fluorescent lighting, where skis tell, or ski equipment or jumping equipment tells a series of stories about the everyday culture of skiing um, and travel uh, on skis. And here you see some of the other environments in the white tunnel. This time the white tunnel was the lead into a kind of historical framing of the argument, which then in the black tunnel became a kind of immersive cinema where on different projected surfaces, you'd have experiences of the kind of alphabet of, ex of emotions that accompany pra the practice of ski jumping and uh, Nordic sports. OK, I'm going to close here by just talking briefly about the second project, which is a documentation center, not a museum to be to strictly speaking, that works instead of in a set of tunnels in a, the case of a monument with a crypt under it. And the monument in question was the founding monument of the fascist regime built, designed by Marcello Piacentini in 1926 directly at Mussolini's command to mark Italy's victory in World War I. Uh, victory, of course, against the Austro-Hungarians and Germans uh, a victory that was not uh, celebrated to quite the same degree by half of the population of this very region. So this was a kind of stake in the ground to mark Italy's conquest of this region as one of the spoils of war. So as you can imagine, this is a monument that has had a very contested history over the course of post-fascist Italy's uh, a, a attempt to assimilate these regions that are regions that, that have flip-flopped between the Austrian side of the border and the Italian side of the border. It's also, of course, a, a triumphal arch. It's a kind of rationalist version of a triumphal arch that proclaims that, it, that we it, Italians have brought civilization to these barbaric northern lands. Uh, it has, it's, it's a work of propaganda, but of the most aggressive sort. And as a result of that, it's a monument that's been essentially off limits uh, since the end of World War II. It's been the site of many, many battles over the identity of Northern Italy. And so when we were called upon with a group of uh, uh, designers, historians, and archivists to design a, a documentation center for this, we wanted to think about some kind of way to symbolically re-motivate the experience of the entire monument. And I'll come back to this when, in closing. But you can see that the one thing we did was to unbalance the neoclassical symmetries of Piacentini's monument by putting a ring an LED, a kind of three-layer LED ring around one of the bands at the bottom of the structure of columns. And that's a gesture that's of some importance because you'll notice that these columns have fascist axe blades in them. They are the founding example of a new columnar order that Piacentini created to mark the fascist revolution as a kind of transformation and continuation of the great revolutions of antiquity. Uh, these columns are called lectorial columns. So to, to change, to re-motivate those columns, um, this, that little uh, LED ring, which was kept under wraps until we opened the space in July of this year, uh, has, serves as a kind of message board. It tells the population that something has happened, that the crypt has been opened up to the public. And there's other signage like the totem that you see sticking up through the entrance here, which is located down on this side. The uh, columns are on the other side. And as you can see, this is a structure that was essentially designed to be an access point to an atrium and a crypt. All of the rooms around the periphery were inaccessible. In fact, they didn't even exist. Uh, they were uh, essentially built as part of the restoration that's led to the establishment of this documentation center. Um, and within this structure, what we tried to do is, is to, to adopt a strategy not unlike the one I mentioned in the case of the galleries, the, the gallerie, uh, which is to say, to think about an immersive experience that's followed by something else, that's more like a kind of more conventional didactic experience of historical 
events. And that is to play along that atrium to crypt movement to emphasize there something that works on a series of different registers and then to move in the peripheral movement around the crypt to tell two different stories that are interwoven together. One is the history of this monument, and, which is told along the inside, and then in the outward facing part, which is where windows are. These are windows. To use the back lighting coming from the natural light to tell the story of the region during this period. So a kind of macro historical framework around the outer periphery, a micro historical framework around the inward periphery. So I'll just, in closing, walk you quickly through the atrium which was designed as this sort of solemn entry space would lead you down into the underground of the uh, monument. Uh, we redesigned with a series of uh, kind of ghostly wreaths, wreaths made up of words, the words that are in a sense the keywords to the documentation that you will find in the course of your journey around the periphery of the building. Uh, to try to give this, it's, it's darker than this, I, I, I kind of raised the illumination here just so that you could see, uh, that are ghostly, ghostly presences, not, uh, not overwhelmingly strong, but um, here we're looking out from inside the crypt back out towards the door. And if you look inside the crypt, what we did is we took the program of inscriptions, which are patriotic inscriptions from Cicero and uh, Horace, calling for sacrifice and devotion to the fatherland and so forth. We actually created a sensor activated system that leads to when uh, somebody walks into the room, the, the lights gradually drop and there's a laser set of laser projections that overlay projections on top of the existing program of projections that are from sources that actually contest or critique the values of the uh, inscriptions that were uh, part of Piacentini's original program. Then the macro-historical narrative, which is the one around the periphery that uses the backlighting, plays off of this use of historical photographs that are out of focus that come into focus. Some of them are seen both as a backdrop uh, and then as an inset that, um, here's an example of what a room looks like, um, to try to create this difference between the sort of this core dark space that's very much about um, this kind of intense layering of darkness and light and instead this much more layered, complex, multi-dimensional sense of how a historical document comes in and out of focus, becomes legible or is illegible at certain distances, at certain angles and so forth. Uh, and, um, and the micro history side built instead or right around the edges of the crypt, uh, we adopted a slightly different strategy. It's not a great photograph. Where, as you can see, to, uh, the um, uh, materials, these are all reproductions because no originals can be displayed in a space that has the kind of humidity conditions uh, here. So like the tunnels here, you have to do something that works as if you had, that has the, if you like, the sed seductive or persuasive power of originals but without the original uh, in frame structures that flex forward or backward towards the wall that create links around the periphery. Um, and as you can see, this is a structure that was largely built just to sustain the monument itself. It wasn't ever intended as an exhibition space. It's a repurposing of an existing structure. And finally, in the edge rooms, there are meta questions that are posed about what is a monument? What is this monument made up of? What do we want monuments to be? How can monuments be used and abused using pieces of furniture that were constructed for the purpose like puzzles that you can open doors of and so forth? So I want to close with this image which is the image of the um, LED ring um, to suggest the, the kind of power that a very crude intervention like this can have, not only to mark the presence of something that of, of, and, and public access to a space that was once uh, closed off, but also the rings, the bands around the fasces were the symbol of the blood that was spilled by the populace to hold together the reeds that are the different populations that make up the citizenry that, hold, that formed Roman society. Uh, and these rings, of course, represent a kind of bond. Not surprisingly, when we think of wedding bands, for instance, we think of the, of the wedding band as a sort of symbol of a bond. Um, on the steps of this monument during the late 1930s, when Italy had already uh, become the object of international um, uh, 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 boycotts because of its invasion of Ethiopia, <clears throat> um, a, ser a series of ceremonies began 
where women would be invited to wed the Italian state and to give their rings, their wedding rings away, their platinum and gold wedding rings, and they would receive an, a wedding ring made out of aluminum in return uh, with uh, Il Duce's name, with Mussolini's name on it. So the idea here was to create a disruptive feature, not only formally, but also in a way to create this dynamic, shifting public address board marker uh, that also reweds, if you like, a monument that has been detached from the fabric of a city back to the city and to the citizenry in a way that reverses the whole history of its use during the era of its construction. Thank you. <laughs>